Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is single raise poker. This is one of the simplest versions of poker we could write down, and it gives us a nice way of practicing semi-separating equilibrium. Let's get to it. The game looks like this. Player two is dealt a king face up. Everyone sees this. Player one is privately dealt either a queen or an ace with equal probability. Only player one sees this card, player two is in the dark. Player one has two choices, either bet or fold. Folding ends the game. If player one bets, then player two either calls or folds. And in both cases there, the game ends. Payoffs are as follows. If player one folds, then player one loses $1 and player two wins $1. If player one bets and player two folds, then now player one wins the dollar and player two loses the dollar. If player one bets and player two calls, then payoffs depend on the card that player one has. A queen type loses $2 and player two wins $2, whereas an ace type wins $2 and player two loses $2. Now, as I said, this is one of the simplest forms of poker one could write down. But part of the point of having this very simple version of poker is to demonstrate just how complicated strategies are, even in a simple game like this. And to drive that point home, I want to have you do a few questions on your own. So I want you to pause now and think about the following three questions. First, what should the ace type's strategy be? How often should the ace type be raising, and how often should the ace type be folding? Same thing for the queen type. How often should the queen type raise? How often should the queen type fold? And given that player two has observed a bet, how often should player two be calling that bet versus folding that bet? And to make this a little bit more difficult for yourself, I want you to only give yourself 30 seconds to answer each question. That would simulate to some degree the pressure that you might have at a poker table if you had to be making these sorts of decisions on the fly. So go ahead and pause this now. Think about each of those questions. Write your answers down below if you would like, and we will get to the answers in one moment. Okay, let's now start working toward answering those questions. The first step toward doing that is going to be to write down a game tree that we know how to analyze. So this is the game tree that corresponds to everything that we just talked about. Nature is beginning the game by drawing player one as either a queen or an ace type with equal probability. Regardless of type, that player is choosing whether to bet or to fold. And only if player one has bet does player two choose whether to call or to fold. And finally, all of those payoffs that we have up there are matching what we had described before. Now to solving this. The first step in actually doing some sort of inferences on the game tree is going to happen on the right side. So this might be another opportunity for you to pause and think about this. Just look at what happens if player one is the ace type. Can you make any inferences there? Well, in fact, we can. Take a look at what happens if the ace type folds. Well, in that case, player one, the ace type, gets a payoff of negative one. If the ace type bets, then regardless of what player two does, whether she calls or folds, the ace type is better off. He'll either get a two or a one. In either case, that's better than the negative one. So we've made an important inference that's going to simplify the rest of this game. The ace type is definitely going to bet, period. Now we need to check what player two should do. There are many options, so let's just go ahead and start off with a pooling strategy. If player one as the queen type pools, then he is betting with certainty. The next thing to do to check whether this is an equilibrium is to calculate player two's best response. Notice that in this case, player two's posterior belief is equal to her prior. There's no new information gleaned because both types are taking an identical action. If we look at what player two's utility is for calling, well, half the time she is facing a queen type 
and receiving a payoff of two. That's on the left half of the tree. On the right half, player one is an ace type, and when player two calls, she receives a payoff of negative two. So if we look all the way up top, 0.5 times two plus 0.5 times negative two, player two's utility for calling is zero. If we have player two fold, you'll notice within the game tree that it doesn't matter whether player one is a queen or an ace type. Player two receives a payoff of negative one. So if we compare those two utilities, well, clearly calling is better than folding. So player two will call as a pure strategy in response to the queen type fooling. If we put that information back into the game tree, the last thing to check is whether the queen type has a profitable deviation. And in fact, he does. If the queen type follows his original strategy to bet, then player two calls and he receives a payoff of negative two. If he were to deviate to folding, he receives a payoff of negative one. Thus, we have no pooling equilibrium. Another possibility is a separating equilibrium. If the queen type is separating, then he is folding as a pure strategy. The next thing to do from here is to still figure out what player two's best response is. Well, if we have player one as betting only as the ace type, then player two knows for sure exactly where she is in the game tree. She knows she's facing the ace type, and so she's simply comparing her payoff for calling to her payoff for folding, and we have a negative two versus a negative one. So player two definitely should be folding under these circumstances. Let's put that information back into the game tree and now investigate whether the queen type has a profitable deviation. And once again, he does. If he sticks with his current strategy and folds, he receives a payoff of negative one. If he bets, then player two, under the mistaken belief that player one is the ace type, chooses to fold, which means now the queen type is getting a payoff of one. One is better than a negative one, and so the queen type has a profitable deviation, and there is no separating equilibrium. The last remaining possibility is a semi-separating equilibrium. That would mean the queen type sometimes chooses to bet and sometimes chooses to fold. And as you'll recall, what I stress when it comes to solving semi-separating equilibria is to remember your indifference conditions. Yes, there is a lot of work to do with solving a semi-separating equilibrium. Yes, you have to calculate a bunch of different things. But as long as you are remembering indifference conditions, you will never be confused about what the next thing is that you have to calculate. You'll just be going through the algorithm and you will be fine at solving these games. So let's put that mantra to the test here. If we have the queen type randomizing between betting and folding, well, the queen type has to be indifferent. The utility for the queen type for folding has to be equal to the utility for betting. Looking up top, the utility for folding is negative one. Looking down below, if player one as the queen type chooses to bet, he could either receive negative two or one depending on what player two is doing. Neither of those payoffs is negative one. However, one is above it and one is below it. And so if player two is also randomizing, then it is possible for player one as the queen type to have an expected utility equal to negative one when he bets. And that's why we have sigma c and sigma one minus c now written there with sigma c representing the probability that player two calls and one minus sigma c representing the probability that player two folds. That mixture of player two is going to induce indifference from the queen type. So specifically what sigma c has to equal in equilibrium is the value that induces that indifference. So let's go ahead and calculate that. The utility for the queen type for betting is going to be sigma c times negative two plus the remaining probability, one minus sigma c times one, which is equal to one minus three sigma c. The utility for folding is negative one, that's a flat value. And again, what needs to be the case in equilibrium 
for the queen type to mix is indifference. So one minus three sigma C has to be equal to negative one. And if we do that and solve for sigma C, we get a probability of two thirds. So we've just made an important inference here. Player two should be calling two thirds of the time and folding one third of the time. Well, what to do next? Remember your indifference conditions. If player two is mixing, then player two must also be indifferent between calling and folding. So the next thing to ask ourselves is what is the belief that player two needs to have at her information set that makes her indifferent between calling and folding? Well, let's call that belief P. So P is going to represent two's posterior belief that player one is a queen type. And so one minus P is the probability that player one is the ace type. And we need to figure out what is the belief that makes player two indifferent here. Well, that again is just a calculation. What's her utility for calling? Well, P portion of the time, she'll receive two. One minus P portion of the time, she'll receive negative two. And so her utility is four P minus two for calling. Meanwhile, if you look at her utility for folding, we've seen this before, it's a negative one flat across the board. So that's her utility for folding, a simple negative one. The belief P doesn't really matter there. Remembering your indifference condition, the utility for calling has to be equal to the utility for folding. And so if we set 4P minus two equal to negative one and solve for P, we get P equal to one fourth. So in equilibrium, it must be the case that player two's posterior belief is that player one is the queen type one fourth of the time and the ace type three fourths of the time. What's next? Well, we need to induce that belief. We know the belief has to be one fourth, three fourths. The way that player one can manipulate that belief is through the queen types strategy. Remember, we still haven't solved for what sigma b has to be but we know that what sigma b needs to be in equilibrium is an amount that induces this one-fourth, three-fourths distribution on the posterior belief. So in other words, if we get out Bayes rule, we'll be taken care of in being able to solve for the queen types mixture. Put more bluntly, one-fourth is the probability that needs to be created in equilibrium. And the way that we get at that posterior belief is through Bayes rule. So we're thinking about one-fourth as two's posterior belief that player one is the queen type. So in the numerator of Bayes' rule, we have the way that we get to that specific outcome, which means half the time nature is drawing the queen type, and with probability sigma b, the queen type is actually betting. And then in the denominator, we have every single way that player two could be arriving at her information set. One of those ways is because nature drew the queen type and with probability sigma b, that queen type bet. So the thing that's in the numerator is also in the denominator. But there's another thing in the denominator. There's another way that player two could reach this information set. It could be the case that nature draws the ace type with probability 0.5 and then 100% of the time that ace type bets. Okay, so that has set up our Bayes rule. And now all we need to do is solve for sigma b. So if we cross multiply and then do a little bit of simplifying and finally solve for sigma b, we have sigma b equal to one third. Okay, so wrapping this all up, we now have a semi-separating equilibrium. The ace type bets with certainty. The queen type bets with probability one third. After observing a bet, Player two believes that player one is the queen type with probability one fourth. That's the important part about a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. That's the thing that's easy to forget. We're not just writing down strategies for each type. We're also writing down beliefs where applicable. And here, that situation is player two's information set. That belief in equilibrium is going to be one fourth. And with that probability one fourth on the queen type, player two's strategy is going to call with probability two-thirds. I want to conclude by relating this more directly back to the original questions and think more holistically about what a semi-separating equilibrium is. The first question, what should the ace do? Well, the ace in this sort of game is the strong type. 
it has nothing to hide. So it doesn't want to fold. It is just going to bully the opponent as much as it can. It's going to bet. That one was the easy question. The more complicated and more interesting questions are the remaining two. What should the queen do? Well, if the queen always were to bet, player two looks at this gamble and says, you know, I think that I should be trying to call that bluff because the queen is very likely in this circumstance. And because that bluff is going to be called, the bluff never should be made. Well, it can't also be the case that the queen type is separating by folding as a pure strategy. If the queen type were to always give up, then now a bluff looks attractive because player two is going to respond to what it thinks as a definitely credible type that ace type, that strong type, by folding. And so the queen type can take advantage of that situation, bluff, and get away with it. But if it's trying to do that, obviously we can't sustain an equilibrium either. The only way we can sustain the equilibrium is if the queen sometimes bluffs by raising and sometimes gives up by folding. And when it's doing that, now it's inducing some uncertainty in what player two should do. It's not obvious whether player two should call or should fold. And what player two's strategy is designed to do is not let the queen take advantage of the situation. It's sometimes calling what might be a bluff and sometimes folding. So sometimes it's paying off the queen and sometimes it's punishing the queen. And thus, what we think of when we're looking at these semi-separating equilibria is essentially rich bluffing strategies and ways that opponents that are in the dark, that don't have that private information, can try to counteract that incentive to bluff. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care, and always remember your indifference conditions.